what is going on? How is this happening? Liverpool face injury crisis. Kroos lays down some home truths. There's COVID madness, international records broken, and a transfer roundup all coming up in the next few minutes. As I'm your host, Mark Froelich, you are the one footballers, and this is the Daily News. First off, Liverpool are facing a very, very severe injury crisis because Joe Gomez looks to be out for rather a long time. The England defender, whilst on international duty, went down in training holding his knee, and now he and the boss, Gareth Southgate, fear that he could be injured for quite a while. He's gone back to Liverpool to do some tests on his knee, but who knows? You may see Gomez out for the season and maybe even missing Euro 2021. This would put him on the injury table alongside Virgil van Dijk as well and leave Liverpool in a whole world of hurt. These two were brilliant in the last few seasons in their Champions League victory and, of course, their Premier League title win as well last season. So to be without both of them for the rest of the campaign, a campaign which already looks ridiculously bizarre and anyone can be anyone, is going to be a massive blow to Jurgen Klopp's side. It means that they now have Jean Matip as the only real first-team centre-back. Fabinho seems to be moving into a centre-back role from midfield because, well, he has to. And then there's youngster Reese Williams and, of course, Nat Phillips as well. But... The main thing about this is that it's probably going to force Liverpool into the transfer market. Now, at the moment, there seems to be two options. One of them a lot more talked about than the other one. That is David Alaba. Of course, with the Bayern Munich defender coming towards the end of his contract next summer, Bayern don't want to lose him on a free. I don't really think they want to lose him at all. So they'll probably accept a lesser fee for him in January. This is where Liverpool can come swooping in. And if they do so... This will probably be the second world-class, unbelievable signing for a great fee that they've made in the last five months, alongside Thiago, also from Bayern Munich. They got him for around 20 to 25 million. It'll probably be the same for David Alaba. This is honestly just fantastic business. Of course, if Alaba's available for that, loads of other teams will want him as well, but I just think that Jurgen Klopp and Liverpool will have enough of a draw to bring him to the club. Alongside this, former Liverpool player Chris Kirkland, that's right, the goalkeeper Chris Kirkland actually played for Liverpool for a little bit, suggested that Liverpool should look at Burnley's James Tarkovsky in the January transfer window. This one makes sense. He's an England international. He's experienced in the Premier League with Burnley. He knows how to defend first and foremost, and he's a very good defender. I'm just not entirely sure he'd want to go to Liverpool where he'd then sit on the bench once Van Dijk and Gomez come back. Like, he's rejected a new deal with Burnley, which runs out in 18 months' time, and obviously he wants to test himself at a higher level. It's not really necessarily a good job to go and do that, and then just, as I said, sit on the bench for a few years. Moving on, though, and to Tony Kroos, who, rather interestingly, I didn't even know this, has a podcast with his brother, Felix. And if that wasn't ridiculous enough, he went hard. He went absolutely crazy on it yesterday as he basically just completely blew UEFA and FIFA out of the water with some outrageous statements that everyone's been thinking, but no one has the balls to say it. So I'm really happy for Kroos. Now, I will read this out because I couldn't memorize all of it. And it's also translated from German, but you'll get the gist of what he was saying. The Real Madrid midfielder said, at the end of the day, with all the extra stuff being made up as players, we are the puppets of FIFA and UEFA. If there was a players union, they wouldn't have the UEFA Nations League break. There wouldn't be a Spanish Super Cup in Saudi Arabia or even a Club World Cup with 20 or more teams that are playing. He also said that everything exists just to suck everything out of the players financially and physically as well. Uh, he said from a sporting point of view that the Super League would be rather interesting, but the small clubs would absolutely suffer. Thank you, Tony. This is what absolutely everyone's been saying. There is no need for all these stupid international breaks or these extra competitions halfway around the world and to suck everything out of every single player. When you've got someone who's clearly benefiting from the system as, as an unbelievable player at the top, being a player world that's known, sorry, worldwide, making a load of money off of everything, he's benefiting from the system. So when he turns around and even admits it's ridiculous, then you know something's got to be wrong. When a, a poorer player or a poorer club say, oh, we need some help, we're not going to last throughout the winter, blah, 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 it's easy for the big clubs to just put them down and say, yeah, but we're worried about the big, more interesting stuff, which is an absolute disgrace. So maybe finally, finally, if more big players come out and say it, they might actually start paying attention. Having said that, and this is actually where one of those players' unions might help, moving on to the next story, which is just 
This is one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard this year surrounding the whole COVID-19 situation. Damagoj Vida, the Croatia defender, played the first 45 minutes of Croatia's game against Turkey last night. At halftime in the dressing room, he got his COVID results back and he tested positive. So they just subbed him out. What is going on? This is a whole um, room of dressing room of teammates that he's been in contact with for the last few days and in the game. This is the opposition. I'd be pissed off if I was a Turkish player, right? Who he's played against for 45 minutes. And then they go ahead and say that the Croatia team is going to go ahead and travel to Sweden for the next international game as well. If I was the Swedish FA, I'd be like, no, I'm not having my players play against a team who have just been sharing a locker room with a guy who's testing positive for COVID. I wouldn't even let them in the country. How is this happening? Uh, am I crazy? Am I the idiot here? This just sounds absolutely, I know you guys say it all the time, that I say it, utterly ridiculous because that's what it is. He shouldn't have been playing in the first place if they knew he could potentially have it. And secondly, once they know we have it, call the game off, don't let everyone else out there for another 45 and certainly don't go on with the rest of the international break. This. This annoyed me, as you can tell. But anyway, we'll move on to the next story because there are a few records broken, some wanted, some unwanted, in the Spain versus Netherlands game. As for De Boer, the manager, Frank De Boer, it's gone absolutely horribly. He has now become the worst manager in Netherlands history for a start, which means that he has not won any... Might do that again. He has now failed to win none of his first four games in charge of the Netherlands team, making it the worst start ever in their history. This is after a one-all draw with Spain where Donny van der Beek sent a message to Ole Gunnar Solskjaer with a fantastic goal to level the scores. As for De Boer, this, this is no surprise. He was sacked from Inter Milan after losing four of his first five games in Serie A a couple of years ago. And then he went to Crystal Palace and lost his first four games without even scoring a goal and he was sacked there. And then he had troubles at Atalanta United in the MLS. So what on earth made the Netherlands think, yeah, you know what? He's a good choice. I mean, Koeman did quite a good job. De Boer, really? I mean, I know he's a legend. I know what he did for Barca and Ajax and obviously the Dutch national team as well. But come on. Choose someone with a little bit of a better CV when it comes to coaching. Anyway, in this game, it also saw Sergio Ramos play his 176th international game for Spain. This brings him level with Gigi Buffon for the most amount of games played at international level from anyone from a European state. Of course, with Gigi Buffon being a goalkeeper, this now makes Sergio Ramos the highest outfield player as well, although I think he may have done that quite a few appearances ago. Anyway, he's still got some way to go to beat the world record of international appearances, but 176, 34 years old, he's still in his prime, maybe just starting to decline just a little bit. You can see him in the Spain squad for certainly the Euros next summer. He'd be 35. He'd be 36 by the time Qatar 2020 rolls around in that December he could potentially still be at that tournament. I'm backing him to break 200 appearances easily. Finally then, after this big rant of the daily news, we come to a roundup of the rest of the day's news that you might have missed. And Athletic Bilbao are interested in bringing in Maurizio Pochettino to be their next manager. Both Spurs and Everton had bids turned down for Chelsea's Kurt Zuma in the transfer window because they want around 45 million euros for the defender. Real Madrid is set to open talks with Danny Carvajal over a new contract for the right back. And lastly but not least, remember Alex Song played for Arsenal, Barcelona, has a glitter career well he is now signed for Arta Solar 7 in Djibouti that's all from me then thank you so much for watching make sure you let me know your thoughts down below and check out everything else you've got going on in one football by clicking here or here until next time though I'll see you guys later